Murphy. We had Joe Shaw had these suddenly for a heroic interpretation of history. When, in writing his history of the Russian Revolution, he singled out Lenin and very unabashedly called Lenin indispensable to the success of the October insurrection. And so I cite from Trotsky's history of the Russian Revolution a kind of an astonishing uh, uh, intervention, a kind of an astonishing insight from the point of view of how much he underscored the role of an individual, the role in a sense of a hero in this revolutionary process. And so Trotsky writes, certainly Lenin didn't create the revolutionary situation, nor could he have done without it. And yet, Lenin knew how to exploit those objective conditions to the account of the proletariat. Uh, the victory of the Russian working class was possible in 1917, but only if a party existed which could mastermind it. In fact, the Bolshevik party couldn't fill that role until its militants understood it. And for that, Lenin was indispensable. Until his arrival in April of 1917, not a single one of the top Bolshevik leaders had properly diagnosed the course of the revolution. Uh, the team of Kamenev and Stalin had pushed the party toward the right, even entertaining the idea of reunification with the Mensheviks. Lenin's arrival burst open a crisis in the party and turned it around. Are we to assume, by some standard of blind determinism, that the party would inevitably have done that anyway? We can in no way be sure of that. Time was a decisive factor. It was a race to the crossing between a right-wing coup and a political revolution of the left. In those circumstances, the party could easily have delayed too long. It could have let the opportunity slip by for years to come. Now, in my view, Trotsky's judgment is perfectly and eminently sound. But you see, we have no purpose, really, in enshrining life, nor do we have any interest precisely in that kind of nostalgia that lingers upon past heroes and upon past heroics. I personally have a very strong but setting objection uh, to the kind of sentimentalism that very frequently affects uh, the left and very frequently infects left-wing militants. Uh, that kind of sentimentalism which really dulls the cutting edge and which most essentially cloaks militants very frequently in the false comfort of looking back at the past and not recognizing the particular tasks of the present. It's the kind of nostalgia and sentimentalism that was once lampooned, you know, by Tom Blair in a magnificent line in a song when talking about the Spanish Civil War, and he said, you know, we had all the best songs and they won all the battles. Well, quite obviously, you can't simply linger upon the six songs for democracy, uh, but you have to confront the problems of defeat, of the problems of what went wrong, and consequently, it is in no way uh, to enshrine Lenin that I cite that particular text. Rather, it is to try to excavate, if you please, certain of the unspoken implications of that particular quotation. Or more precisely, to try to formulate certain propositions about the Leninist project, which, in touching upon the modalities and the strategy of social change, really concern us and touch on the most intimate parts of our political existence. That in the first place, and as a primary proposition, Lenin, more than any other militant of his era, understood what the primal importance was of building a revolutionary party and of adapting that party through all of the conjunctures and all of the convolutions of history, adapting that party to fast-changing events, adapting its structure and adapting its tactics. And that point is perfectly primordial, because in the entire Leninist project, there is nothing so important as that. The need for a party which is very clear-eyed about events as they pass, and which is armed with a strategy to exploit those events, to act as a mediator uh, between the masses, whose consciousness is always imperfect, whose consciousness always fluctuates, and a gathering social crisis. And it is precisely to that point that George Lukács was to speak so eloquently in a series of articles that he was to write in 1924, that great and eminent Hungarian Marxist philosopher, a series of articles which are gathered together in a little book called Lenin. And he describes in that little book what the Leninist idea of the party is 
and how Lenin left a legacy in that Bolshevik party of 1917, which is a very enduring lesson for revolutionary movements that come afterwards. And this is what we find in Lukács' text on Lenin. The party must, on the one hand, have theoretical clarity and the toughness necessary to follow the right course, regardless of the irresolution of the masses and their sudden flip-flops, even at the risk, at moments, of seeming isolated from those masses. But on the other hand, it should remain flexible and receptive enough to learn lessons from every manifestation of the masses, from their every collective action, which reveal revolutionary possibilities which they themselves cannot see. And you have a feeling that Lukács is thinking of that Leninist contribution from April of 1917, when he came back to Russia and saw in that vast energy that the mass was manifesting in forming those Soviet Yes, a revolutionary potential which enabled him to say, even though others were not saying it, all power to the Soviets and let us pass to the second stage of the revolution. Because Lukács goes on to make this conclusion. If the party isn't capable of incessantly adapting its theoretical understanding to the ever-fluctuating course of events, it falls behind the times. From the avant-garde, it becomes the rear guard, and it loses contact with the masses. In other words, a party which, even if it's used to its lie, over and against the lack of comprehension of the populace itself and of the popular classes, nonetheless learns at every moment from the potentialities that those masses themselves create by their intervention into the course of history. And so you come to a second proposition, which really is a corollary of the first. And that is that Lenin, really almost more than any militant of his time, managed to reunite theory and practice, managed in a sense to make that interaction of theory and practice work, which had been so badly severed by the so-called orthodox Marxists of the Second International, who had abstracted theory from life, abstracted, if you please, from that kind of revolutionary practice, which is so important in refurbishing any kind of theory. You see, we're talking about the Lenin now, who in the course of his own struggle with militants in the Bolshevik party, who were hewing to orthodox positions, to the theory of historical development, to the stages of historical development, very frequently cited a text or an observation of Goethe, and used this observation over and again in his debates and in his polemics. And the observation was that theory is gray, but the tree of life is green. In other words, that theory itself really is gray because it doesn't get out into the life of practice, into the very sunlight of revolutionary intervention, of revolutionary action. And it's only if it does, after all, that it begins to reflect or represent something very real. Uh, we're talking about the Lenin who refused to be hamstrung by that theory of historical stages, a theory, after all, which Marx had developed in order to give some understanding of the past and some comprehension of the present, but who never thought of that theory as an axiom or a shibboleth uh, to be applied at every moment in every possible or conceivable context. And we're thinking about that Lenin who walked every convolution in the course of events, who walked, after all, everything that was happening in order to put his finger on those revolutionary possibilities which no militant were his soul ever could let pass by. And we're thinking about that Lenin, who in the very marrow of his bone, understood that Marxism, after all, was deformed by abstract theory. And that theory took on life only when it was connected to practice. And that's why you have the Lenin, for example, who could look at those Soviets in 1917 and understand that they reflected an upsurge of mass energy and mass creation activity, which could be the real propelling force from one stage of a revolution to another. And the Lenin, who was the only militant who was willing to set against the opposition of Rosa Luxemburg, against the 
opposition of Radek or of Bukhari, who was willing to say that there was real revolutionary force in national liberation movement, who committed his own Bolshevik party to the position of self-determination for oppressed nations, a self-determination very different from Wilson's conception of self-determination, because in Lenin's lexicon, it meant, after all, a throwing off of the colonial yoke, a throwing off of colonial oppression. It meant, in terms of the oppressed nations of Russia, who constituted, after all, a majority of the population living within the Tsarist Empire, it meant for them the right of cultural and political autonomy, or, if they chose, the right actually to secede politically from that Tsarist Empire. And what it did was to ally Bolshevism to the potential revolutionary force of the Third World Revolution, and that alliance was not broken literally for decades. What gave communism force, literally, in that Third World was that so early recognition of that right of self-determination, of that revolutionary potential of these national liberation movements. And so once again, it is Lukács who puts his finger on this major accomplishment of Lenin, on this kind of fusion of theory and practice, because what he writes in that little book called Lenin, it is the essence of history constantly to produce the new. And no theory is infallible enough to encompass all that newness in advance. Thus, the revolutionary party isn't supposed to impose a strategy of action on the masses, which has been worked out abstractly and for all times. It is supposed to learn constantly from the struggles of the masses and their endlessly inventive methods of struggle. The organization should change and adapt as those struggles develop, for dogmatism in theory and sclerosis in organization are fatal to the party. And then Lukács makes a concluding sentence, and you must have in mind the way in which that Bolshevik party really did adapt in 1917. How it was a party of 23,000 on the eve of the February Revolution, and was a party already of 200,000 at the end of July of 1917, a party that opened its way and opened its doors as the consciousness of the mass deepened and as its class struggle really came to a point of no return. And so Lukács concludes in a magnificent sentence, Lenin's conception of the party is the sharpest break with the mechanistic and fatalistic version of Marxism, that a party will simply inherit the world as capitalism inevitably collapses. It is the practical realization of Marx's revolutionary insight, his 11th thesis on Feuerbach, that philosophers have interpreted the world in many ways, but the point is to change it. And consequently, you have a Lenin who, in that fusion or interaction of theory and practice, is perfectly willing to scrap the axiom or scrap the, the shibboleth as the events, after all, occur which permit it. And that, of course, leads to our third proposition, which is the most precise. And that is that Lenin had the capacity to adapt his party to its essential, indispensable, and irreducible function. That is, to prepare and to orchestrate the socialist revolution. There is no other imprescriptible function for a socialist party but that, and Lenin knew it. Now, we've already described the way in which Lenin returned in April of 1917 and told his party that you have no business supporting bourgeois democracy, that that is finished, that you must struggle against the provisional government at all costs, that you must raise high the banner of all power to the Soviets, and he did that against tremendous obstacles, uh, because most of the Bolsheviks were riveted to that orthodox theory of stages, and many of them, like Kamenev and Rykov, thought that there was still a lot of mileage left in that period of bourgeois democracy to improve the lot of the working class, and what Lenin did was to cut the ties very decisively uh, between the Bolshevik party and any class collaboration or any collaboration with other socialist parties that were willing to support uh, this bourgeois democracy. And what remains to be demonstrated is simply the last act. Namely, 
the capacity of lead in those critical months of September and October of 1917 to impose upon a party that was very reluctant uh, to accept that lie, to impose upon the party the idea that an armed insurrection was both necessary and possible in the fall of 1917, and secondly, to galvanize that party into action uh, so that it prepared and finally carried through uh, that particular armed insurrection. Now you must understand that the seven weeks that passed for what we call the Kornilov push, in other words, the effort of a coup d'etat of the right uh, that occurred at the end of August of 1917, uh, from that Kornilov push uh, to the Bolshevik uprising of the 25th and 26th of October, seven weeks passed, which the Russians called the Kerenshchina. In other words, the seven weeks in which Kerensky, who is a key person in the provisional government really presides over its decomposition, in which Russian society uh, basically decomposes. It really is very difficult to describe this to you. Uh, Trotsky has said it so very much better in his great history of the Russian Revolution. Uh, but just think, you see, that from revolt you are going to chaos. Uh, that in the cities, in September and in October, uh, there is terrific street action, which is really pillaging, which is rioting which becomes very headless and very formless. In Tashkent, for example, on the 1st of September of 1917, simply rioters from the street dispossessed the local Soviet, saying it was much too moderate, and established a revolutionary provisional committee. Or in the cities of Kharkov, or the city of Rostov, in the middle of September, you find workers who are half famished, who are on the street simply pillaging the shops simply rioting very randomly. And that pattern is even more indelibly imposed upon the countryside uh, because the poor peasants uh, begin a round of terrific pillaging of graves and other stocks that are held by either the landlords or the richer peasants. And they begin to burn manor houses and they begin to dispossess the great landlords and even at times to kill them and of course they seize Land. And what you have by the beginning of October is that in 624 districts of what constitutes old Russia, that there are peasant revolts or riots in 484 of them, and that it is even more extensive in Siberia. Now it is a pertinent question as to what this means about the political consciousness of the peasantry. Probably not very much. That what it was was a drive toward land, not the kind of political consciousness that said we want specifically either a socialist regime or we want another kind of government. But having said that, let me point out that a circumstantial alliance with the Bolsheviks was really being formed. That even though the old social revolutionaries had mainly a political grip upon the countryside traditionally, that more and more the peasants began to hear this word Bolshevik and to equate it with the idea of the breakup of these big estates and the redistribution of land. So that it is Victor Serge, for example, in his marvelous little book called The Year One of the Revolution, who tells us about a peasant meeting in a village outside the city of Tver at the end of September of 1917. And there's a social revolutionary who goes to the peasants and he says, don't listen to the Bolsheviks. They are defeatists. They are traitors to the country. Uh, they want to give our beautiful army over to the Germans. And besides that, they are plunderers. They don't respect, after all, the rights of private property, and the peasants interrupt this speaker, and they say, enough of you, what are you going to do about the land? Bring us a Bolshevik! <laughs> and consequently, you begin to get, you see, of that alliance of circumstance. And you do in the army also. What is the Russian army? 
in September and October of 1917. It's a huge band of wanderers, men who are deserting in tremendous numbers. There are men who have nothing to eat in the army, who have no shoes to go on the feet, who begin to wander back to the villages, who lead some of these insurrections of the peasants, who wander about the cities. Again, Victor says, who tells us that in the city of Moscow, in the middle of September, uh, there were soldiers who had openly deserted, who were parading down the main streets of Moscow with placards that were saying, we will die on the barricades, but never on the fighting fronts. And against this, the provisional government is a history of pathos, a history of tragedy, and mainly a history of farce. Because you have a Kerensky who moves increasingly into the camp of counter-revolution that he's used at a time when the class struggle is so deep that it is at the point of no return. You cannot turn the clock back. Kerensky is insisting upon coalition by which we mean class collaboration. And more than that, that he is putting the key positions in his ministry in the hands of very reactionary bourgeois. There is that foreign minister, Tereschenko, who goes to Buchanan, the British ambassador, right on the eve of the October Revolution, and this Tereschenko says the only thing that will save Russia is a counter-revolution. Uh, the vice deputy, the one who is mainly in charge, while Kerensky was off on the front, haranguing the soldiers uselessly, the vice premier was a great industrialist who had threatened his workers with closing down the factory uh, because they were getting out of hand, and consequently the provisional government preaches nothing but discipline and sacrifice to starving masses of people. But you see, the moderate socialists were no better. Granted that they finally lost control of the Soviet in Moscow by the 5th of September to the Bolsheviks, that they lost control of the Soviet of Petrograd by the 9th of September, but they still control the Central Executive Committee of the Congress of Soviets, because that first Congress had been held in June when the Social Revolutionaries and the Mensheviks were a majority. There was supposed to be a second Congress to convene on the 15th of October, they kept trying to put it off, afraid that the Bolsheviks would now be in control, but they used that leverage, you see, within the framework of that executive committee of the All-Russian Congress of Soviets to collaborate fully uh, with the provisional government, uh, to insist uh, that the demands that the popular classes were making uh, could not be met in those particular circumstances. So you get au bras bouf, uh, that the only thing uh, that the government does in this period of the Kerens Chino is to call a kind of bogus organization called the Democratic Conference, uh, which is convened together on the 14th of September. And that really is to be an estate general, uh, the kind of estate general that the French called together in May of 1789. But remember uh, that the French estate general of May of 89 was the beginning of the revolution. If this had been done in February, it was one thing. But here in September, to call together 1,500 representatives of the left and of the right, of capital and labor, uh, to say that you can really resolve uh, these tremendous contradictions of Russian society by class collaboration, ludicrous. Now the Bolsheviks, since Lenin was in hiding in Finland, uh, the Bolsheviks decided to participate in this democratic conference, and they sent 66 representatives out of these 1,500. But the question arose of whether they would participate in what was to be called the Provisional Council of the Republic or the Pre-Parliament. Because out of these 1,500, uh, there were 550 elected who were to sit from the 7th of October as a kind of pre-parliament to prove uh, that Russia could really be a bourgeois parliamentary republic, uh, to make that constituent assembly a little bit closer, a little bit more of a reality. Now, Lenin was out of his skull when he thought that the Bolsheviks were going to participate in this pre-parliament, and consequently he writes from his exile in Finland a very decisive note. And 
Paul Lennon is not kidding about boycotting this free parliament. Free parliament, class collaboration, when the Bolsheviks ought to be out forming an insurrection and making their alliance with the masses very clear. And so he writes to the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party on the 23rd of September, we must boycott the free parliament. We must leave it and go to the Soviet of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies, to the trade unions, to the masses in general. We must call on them to struggle. We must give them a clear and correct slogan. Disperse the Bonapartist gang of Kerensky and his fake free parliament with his Tsaretelli Duma. The Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, even after the Kornilov revolt, refuse to accept our compromise of peacefully transferring the power of the, to the Soviets. They have again sunk into the morass of filthy and mean bargaining with the cadets, down with the Mensheviks and social revolutionaries, struggle against them ruthlessly. Uh, but in the Central Committee, and again in a Bolshevik conference, uh, the Bolsheviks decided that they would go into this pre-parliament anyway and see if possibly they didn't have a place, a forum, by which to reach the mass again. And so it opened on the 7th of October, 550, mind you, uh, just three weeks before the whole thing finishes, and of those 550, 247 belong to the right, belong to the bourgeoisie, only 302 uh, belong, after all, to the parties of the left, the Bolsheviks have 66, Trotsky looks all of that over and decides it's perfectly useless, and consequently leaves the parade of Bolsheviks out of this free parliament with this statement. We, the Bolshevik fraction of the Social Democratic Party, announce that we have nothing in common with this government of treason to the people and with this council of counter-revolutionary connivance. We refuse to shield it either directly or indirectly for a single day and out the Bolsheviks walk, which means that this pre-parliament becomes a ludicrous, ridiculous shadow. Uh, the one party that really has its hand on the pulse of the nation no longer participates participates in it. Suhanov is magnificent. He said that that pre-parliament made the wartime Duma under Rasputin's iron heel look like a grand, great, historic parliament. <laughs> and all that while, the Bolsheviks were going to the heights of the revolutionary movement. They were winning over peasants because of the land question. They were winning over regiment after regiment of the army on the peace question. They surely had the sailors, the Baltic Fleet sailors, met in a congress in the first days of October and pledged their allegiance to the Bolsheviks, sent a message to Kerensky, addressed to Napoleon Kerensky, traitor of the revolution, we send you our worst curses. <laughs> there is a kind of map ground swell. And certainly, the high point of this is the Bolshevik conquest of the two leading Soviets and of a whole state of others. Because it is on the 5th of September of 1917 that the Bolsheviks become a majority in the Moscow Soviet. You see, the factory committees began to recall their deputies and began to send others much more radical and consequently Consequently, on that 5th of September, a vote was taken of no confidence in the provisional government and passing power to the Soviets, and it passed 325 to 250, which meant that the Bolsheviks controlled the Moscow Soviet. After that, uh, they controlled the Baku Soviet, uh, they controlled the Kharkov Soviet. Finally, on the 9th of September, it was Petrograd, because the same motion of no confidence confidence in the provisional government was put, and it passed 519 to 414, which meant that the Bolsheviks controlled that. They elected the presiding officer. It was Trotsky, the same Trotsky, who had been the presiding officer 12 years earlier in that country, in that St. Petersburg Soviet of 1905. Lenin didn't care, really, about the Soviets. That is to say, the Soviets, after all, had been part and parcel of a strategic lie for months of that February revolution. 
He saw, after all, in the Soviets, and in the possibility of Bolshevik majorities in the Soviets, the chance to go peacefully to power. In other words, to carry the Bolshevik party peacefully to power. But July days had changed him. In July, it was perfectly demonstrable that there would be no going to power without force, without violence. Uh, because the repressive force of the bourgeoisie and the collaboration, in fact, of the moderate socialists was perfectly clear. At that time, on the 29th of July, Lenin wrote off and dismissed the Soviets. He said the Soviets are zeros, marionette, marionettes. Real power doesn't belong to them, it resides in the genuine mass. But now in September, that the Bolsheviks were in the majority in these important Soviets, they became important to Lenin again. Uh, because if the Bolsheviks took power, and you had the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets meeting simultaneously, you could get the imprint of those Soviets. In other words, that the Bolshevik taking of power would have literally, in a formal way, the imprint of mass approval. And consequently, in that context, as that All-Russian Congress of Soviets was to meet sometime in October, Lenin began to think that what was all important to prevent chaos, to prevent that chaos from leading to counter-revolution, to prevent the Germans from taking the city of Petrograd. Everything converged at the point of making an armed insurrection. But you have militants in that Bolshevik party who remember very well for whom it is still fresh in the mind that they had been almost clobbered to death after the July demonstrations, that they had called those July demonstrations, that they had been pre Mature, but they had been blamed on the Bolsheviks, and the party was almost destroyed. And consequently, as late as the 30th of August of 1917, you have Zinoviev writing in the Pravda, which is then under the editorship of Stalin, and you have him writing an article, What We Must Not Do, in which we read, Remember the fate of the Paris Commune. We Bolsheviks, the Bolsheviks must avoid any premature attempt to take power by force. And that was the primary attitude in the party. No idea of an armed insurrection at that point. Lenin, sitting in Finland, out of its skull, thinking that this was the moment, and if the moment passed, it might not, it might not come again. And so he began to write to the Central Committee. And you write, you know, and when Lenin writes to the Central Committee, it has to be read, obviously. And so he writes somewhere between the 12th and the 14th of September. These documents, which come in volume 26 of the Collected Works, which is one of the really fruitful volumes, and these documents are perfectly magnificent because you really do follow this horrendous struggle out of which, on which so much turned. And here is Lenin in that letter that he writes to the Central Committee sometime between the 14th and the, uh, and the, uh, uh, between the 12th and the 14th of September. And he lays it out this way. The Bolsheviks having obtained a majority in the Soviets of workers and soldiers deputies of both capitals, Moscow and Petrograd, can and must take state power into their hands. They can, because the active majority of revolutionary elements in the two chief cities is large enough to carry the people with it, to overcome the opponent's resistance, to smash him, and to gain power and retain power. Now listen, this is very important, because this is the stabilizing element of the revolution. This is what Lenin does to a T on the morrow of that taking of power. For the Bolsheviks, by immediately proposing a democratic peace, and then immediately giving the land to the peasants, and by re-establishing the democratic institutions of the Soviet, will form a government which nobody will be able to overthrow. No answer uh, to Lenin's document of the 12th of September. And so he writes again on the 16th of September. Now this is the creative and classic document, because this is the one in which Lenin lays out the art of insurrection. If you're going to get into this line of work, then quite obviously the art of insurrection becomes important. To be successful, he writes to the Central Committee, instructing them in something really that they hadn't considered. To be successful, insurrection must rely not upon conspiracy and not upon a party, but upon the advanced class. Point one, that you really do have to
you have the mass support of the proletariat. And that the Bolsheviks certainly had through the factory committees, through their control of the cities. Point two, the insurrection must rely upon a revolutionary upsurge of the people. That you certainly had. You had all of this tremendous volatility, this intensifying class struggle. That is the second point. Then insurrection must rely upon that turning point in the history of the growing revolution when the activity of the advanced ranks of the people is at its height and when the vacillation in the ranks of the enemy and in the ranks of the weak, half-hearted, and irresolute friends of the revolution are strongest. And that you certainly have. That provisional government was irresolute, and certainly the Mensheviks and the social revolutionaries were. Then he goes on to say that you are worried about July days, about the fact that we were almost clobbered in July days. And he says that was very different. On the 3rd and 4th of July, it could have been argued, without violating the truth, that the correct thing to do was to try to take power, since our enemies would in any case have accused us of insurrection and ruthlessly treated us as rebels. However, to have decided on this account in favor of taking power at that time would have been wrong. It would have been wrong, said Lenin, because the control over the working class, the authority over the working class, was not clear. There had not been a Bolshevik majority in the Petrograd and Moscow Soviets. The Kornilov coup hadn't been tried. There hadn't been the obvious threat of a counter-revolution. Now it was all different. Now there was no reason to hesitate. And Lenin goes on at the very end to say, uh, in terms of the imperative of that, that if there is hesitation, there may be a historic moment lost forever. That letter was received by the Central Committee, and on Bukharin's word, it is the only document the Central Committee of the Bolshevik Party ever received from Lenin that it burned. And he burned the document at once, thinking it mad, thinking it crazy, and thinking it very dangerous if it should ever get into the hands of the police. At that point, uh, Lenin, of course, decided he would have to use blackmail. And consequently, he wrote on the 29th of September, in which he indicated, you are not answering my letters. And the things that I write to the Pravda are not getting into the newspaper. There's only one thing that I can do. In view of the fact that the Central Committee has left unanswered the persistent demands I have been making for such a policy ever since the beginning of the Democratic Conference, and since all of my articles in the Pravda have been deleted or have been, uh, uh, or have been uh, uh, reduced in size, I am compelled to regard this as a subtle hint at the unwillingness of the Central Committee <laughs> even to consider this question. A subtle hint that I should keep my mind shut and as a proposal for me to retire. I am compelled, therefore, to tender my resignation uh, from the Central Committee, which I hereby do, reserving for myself freedom to campaign among the rank and file of the party and at the party congress. Now, I can't believe that Lenin thought that they were really going to accept uh, that resignation. And they didn't, of course, and they said, Ilyich, what you must do is come and see us personally uh, so that we make sure that you haven't gone off your rocker. And what they suggested was that he come back to Petrograd in disguise and come to the Central Party Committee, uh, which would be held on the 10th of October. So Lenin shaved off his beard and put on a wig and put on big eyeglasses, which he never wore, and consequently in disguise went back to Petrograd on the 9th of October, appeared at the Central Party, uh, the Central Committee meeting of the 10th of October, and argued his case very vehemently. He said, now is the time. There will be a missed moment if you don't prepare for this insurrection now. The opposition was vehement from Zinoviev and from Kamenev. And finally, when the resolution was put to prepare an insurrection, to commit the Bolshevik party to an insurrection, it was passed by a vote of 10 to 2. Uh, that Zinoviev and Kamenev voted against it. And so much was still this an open question that the next day, on the 11th of October, those two, Zinoviev and Kamenev sent out a joint letter that went to the party committee in Petrograd, in Moscow, in Finland, that went to the 
refractory committees, and that said, this really is madness, that what it will do to call for insurrection at this stage is not only playing with the future of our party and the revolution, but also that of the world revolution. What they proposed was that the Bolsheviks wait for the convocation of a constituent assembly in which, said Zinoviev and Kamenev, they would get more than a third of the seats and consequently the peaceful passage to power uh, might be possible. Consequently, a second Central Party Committee meeting was held that on the 16th of October, a little bit larger. Now there were 25 rather than 12 because they invited representatives of the factory committees and so forth. Again, Lenin argued his case by a vote of 19 to 2 with four abstentions. That was passed again, but Lenin made one concession. And it was the concession that Trotsky had been demanding, and that was that the timing of the insurrection should be the opening meeting on the 25th of October of the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets, in which the Bolsheviks would have a majority so that they could put their stamp of approval upon this insurrection. That didn't satisfy Zinoviev and Kamenev, and they did what really flicked Lenin out. They went on the 18th of October to a non-party newspaper, the newspaper of Novaya Zhen, of Maxim Gorky, who was not a Bolshevik and was really close to the Mensheviks, and they wrote an article in which they revealed the secret of that the Bolsheviks were preparing an insurrection and they were opposed to it. Well, Lenin was beside himself. And he immediately wrote to the Central Committee, they may be old comrades of mine, but that's strike-breaking, no matter which way you put it. And consequently, they must be expelled from the Central Committee and expelled from the party. The very interesting thing is that they were not expelled from the party, and that only Kamenev was expelled from the Central Committee by a vote of five to four. And that the conciliation torment was led at the Central Committee by Stalin who was proved later to be, in some quarters, at any rate, not conciliatory. <laughs> and of course it raises the question of whether Stalin really was in favor of that armed insurrection at that particular time, still a question of some ambiguity. But the importance of the zinoviev kamenev thing is that they had to go outside the party to express themselves. In other words, that the party by that time really had been recaptured by Lenin. He had committed it to the idea that all of the elements were there. The moment was right. And it's at that moment that the stage comes to be occupied by that most dramatic figure of Trotsky. Because Lenin, you see, built a party, and Lenin made a strategy, and Lenin turned that party to the need for insurrection at the proper moment, but Lenin was not the great agitator, Lenin was not the great dramatist, Lenin was not the great actor, as Sukhanov says, and it is suddenly in those few days before that October <coughs> insurrection that Trotsky is everywhere. And it is a great orator, you know, and it is somebody whose voice really is the voice of the Elan, of the enthusiasm, of the fury of the mass. And consequently, he goes from meeting to meeting to generate that enthusiasm for the insurrection. In addition to which, Trotsky has the organization for the insurrection. He is president of the Petrograd Soviet that is now in Bolshevik hands. And from the 9th of October, there is what is called the, the Revolutionary Military Committee. Uh, that Revolutionary Military Committee had been established on the 9th of October to arm the workers against a possible invasion of Petrograd by the Germans. And consequently, the Red Guard, which had existed from the beginning of the February Revolution, but became more and more a major armed working class force, the Red Guard began to be turned into a very solid phalanx of armed workers, probably 25,000 of them in Petrograd on the very eve of that insurrection of the 25th and the 26th. And consequently, with that organization, all you needed was ideological training, and that came through the Bolshevik party, through the factory committees, in the Bolshevik hands. By the time you come to the week of the 22nd of October of 1917, there is a will for this insurrection in the city of Petrograd.
and the insurrection itself of the 25th and 26th of October. You know, I who have lived my life with those great days, for example, of the 14th of July of 1789, and can recognize a grand journée when I see one. And there is something rather disappointing about the 25th and 26th of October. It has none of that grandeur, you know, that the taking of the Bastille by 953 workers had in 1789. And the reason is perfectly obvious. On the day, the 26th of October, when the provisional government falls, and when the Winter Palace is taken, there are no great street processions, there are no great manifestations, there are five casualties in the taking of the Winter Palace is all, because the whole shell was all that was left, that it was rotted inside, that there was no opposition, it just plopped. <laughs> And you see, that gave some people the idea that it really was a coup d'etat, that it really was a kind of a conspiracy by the Bolsheviks. And there's a marvelous guy named Jacques Sadoul, who later became an important member of the French Communist Party, and who at that time was in the French military delegation to Russia. And Jacques Sadoul, who wrote back to Albert Thomas, he said, don't be deluded. This is not a coup d'etat. The reason there is no opposition is because the popular mass are with this change, with the fall of the provisional government. And it is Sukhanov who tells us much the same thing, because Sukhanov says, to call the October Revolution a military conspiracy rather than a national uprising is utterly absurd, since the Bolsheviks at that moment had the broad support of the popular classes. They already were the de facto rulers of Russia. And so it begins with a provocation on the 23rd of October. It is a provocation of a provisional government. It suddenly lurches a little bit, and it shuts down the Bolshevik press with a few loyalist troops, and it shuts down the Bolshevik printing plant. The 24th, the Revolutionary Military Committee of the Soviet, directed by Trotsky, goes and reopens the Bolshevik newspaper, reopens the Bolshevik press, and consequently issues an order to all of the detached of the Russian army in Petrograd to be ready for a coup d'etat from the right which is being planned by Kerensky and the provisional government and consequently on the 25th in the earliest morning hours the plan for the insurrection goes into effect. 2 a.m. the postal system is occupied. 3 a.m. the telegraph center. By 7 a.m. of the 25th of October all of the railway stations are Taken by 10 a.m. of the 25th comes this document, this manifesto from the Revolutionary Military Committee. The provisional government is deposed. All state authority has passed into the hands of the Revolutionary Military Committee, organ of the Petrograd Soviet, acting in the name of the proletariat. Long live the revolution of workers, soldiers, and peasants. It remained only to take the Winter Palace, where the ministers of the old government, where the the ministers of the provisional government were hiding out, still meeting. Kerensky escaped. He got out of the Winter Palace and immediately went to refuge, where do you suppose? At once to the American Embassy. There, in an automobile with an American flag, he got out of the city to the north to try to rally commanders to march upon Petrograd and to unseat this revolution, all of which petered out within five days. But it still took an armed force to penetrate that way Winter Palace and to find those particular ministers. By 7 in the evening of the 25th of October, the Kronstadt sailors arrive, having come down the Neva River and arriving in Petrograd. By 10, they had joined with armed Red Guard and under the leadership of Antonov of Stenko, entered into the Winter Palace. Well, there, there really was no fighting. Those who were defending simply fraternized. And then, from about midnight until 2 a.m., the the problem was to find the provisional government because it's a palace of 400 rooms. <laughs> they wandered through all of these immense corridors looking for the ministers. Finally found them at 10 minutes after 
who, on the morning of the 26th of October, by that time, by midnight, at the turn of the 26th of October, the second All-Russian Congress of Soviets had gathered and had opened its sessions. By 2.30, Kamenev reports to that particular Congress that yes, the provisional government has fallen and the ministers have been taken prisoner and put in Peter Paul Fortress and all power now passes to the Soviets. There was acclamation, there was pandemonium. But those who were the social revolutionaries and those who were the Mensheviks couldn't take it and consequently they got up to walk out. And poor Yuri Martov, because Martov is a good man and a very good militant and someone who deserved a lot better in history than he ever got, but who was somebody caught up in a party that was literally impossible. And consequently Martov rushed to the podium and he said as the social revolutionaries and Mensheviks were walking out, he said for for heaven's sake, you Bolsheviks, do something to compromise. Do something to make a coalition government. Keep the socialists together. That's crucially important. And of course, it brought Trotsky into action. And Trotsky at this time was really living on speed. And consequently, he moved into that central podium at this point. And with all of that sarcasm and with all of that kind of vitriol that this man could conjure up, that he really conjured up out of the fire. And consequently, Trotsky made what really is one of the great responses in the whole litany of revolutionary literature. The masses of the people have followed our banner, and our insurrection is victorious. And now we are told, renounce your victory, make concessions, compromise, and with whom? With the wretched groups who have left us, should those millions of workers and peasants represented in this Congress make a compromise as between equals with men who are ready not for the first time to leave us to the mercy of the bourgeoisie. No, here no compromise is possible. To those who have left and to those who suggested to us, we must say, you are miserable bankrupts. Your role is over, so where you ought to be, go where you ought to be, into the garbage heap of history. <laughs> so it was that there was a rupture that was profound. At nine o'clock that next morning, it is Lenin who appears to a kind of pandemonium and comes in to read off the list of people's commissars who will form the government. All of them Bolsheviks, Lenin the head of the government, Trotsky at, foreign, at the foreign ministry, Lunacharsky at education, Stalin at nationalities, Ovsenko at war, and uh, uh, all of this, Zuryaknikov uh, uh, at labor, all of this a uniform Bolshevik government approved overwhelmingly, and then Lenin says, and now, we proceed to construct socialism. Well, what this 47-year-old man was thinking when he said that to a Congress is I leave to your psychological imagination. It suffices to say that neither quantitatively, in terms of what was there, nor qualitatively, in terms even of what they had in mind, were they going to begin to construct socialism. But this much is true, that this October insurrection is the very first effort in history, with the exception of the Paris Commune, which attempted to establish another order on the self-conscious principle of the rule of the working class. And the Bolshevik party represented that ideal and the proletariat at that moment became the dominant class in Russian history. And then it was to Lenin's great tactical genius that was left the task of stabilizing it. And he did it just as he said he would. That very first meeting, two decrees, a land decree that all the land of the biggest states, of the church, of the state, were to be nationalized and to be turned over to peasant committees to be redistributed to the poor peasantry. And that won the peasant. And then a peace decree, a decree that was directed to the peoples and governments of the belligerent countries. Uh, the idea being that the belligerent governments would turn down 
of this plea for a democratic immediate peace without annexations, but that the peoples of the belligerent countries, when they saw that their governments would turn it down, would overthrow their governments. And so it was that this government of the Bolsheviks immediately published the Tsarist archives, in other words, those secret treaties that showed that all of the Allies had imperialistic aims. And yet there was no revolution in the West, and peace was the sine qua non of staying in power. And so it was that the Russians made an armistice with Germany on the 2nd of December, and on the 22nd of December went to Brest-Litovsk to begin peace negotiations. And by the 5th of January of 1918, the terms that the Germans imposed were so draconian that would have stripped not only Finland, but the Baltic countries and Poland and white Russia from Russia, that there was a terrific struggle inside the Bolshevik party as to whether to pursue these peace talks or not. And that struggle centered around three positions. The position of Lenin, that yes, we must have peace with the Germans, even if it is only a beachhead that is left, because if we continue this war a moment longer, the German army will overrun Petrograd, and what the hell will be left? And Trotsky's position of neither peace nor war to go, great throat that he was, to brest and talk and talk to the West, talk over the heads of those German negotiators and urge those Western proletariats to make a revolution, or possibly to urge the Allied governments to send enough help to Russia so that she could continue the war against an aggressive German imperialism. And then a left-wing position headed by Bukharin, a revolutionary defense of the country that let us arm all of the people, let us have that revolutionary defense. Oh, left-wing demagoguery, says Lenin. The people don't have it left. They are really exhausted. And so it is on the 5th of January that Trotsky's position wins 9 to 7. They continue the negotiations, and the Germans ask more. They continue their penetration of Russia, and by then Ukraine also is added to their list. By the time the terms of the Peace of brest are hammered out, the Russians will have lost 26% of their population, 27% of their arable land, and 75% of all of their iron and steel. And Lenin said, you've got to accept that. And the 3rd of March of 1918, the Peace of brest was signed. And why not in Lenin's terms? You have that beachhead and you know there will be a revolution in Germany and you will get it back. And so it was that Lenin knew how to curb the excesses of that party, to adapt it to its particular need of insurrection, to stabilize it for the moment. Oh, gee. And yet, there is in that Leninist project risk and conception which I think we have to question. Risk, certainly. Risk with the peasantry. Rosa Luxemburg spelled that out in that text on the Russian Revolution very well. And Rosa said, you are messing around with an individual landholding peasantry, and what will that do to your revolution? The seizure of the land and estates by the peasants, according to the short and precise slogan of Lenin and his friends, go and take the land for yourself, simply led to the sudden chaotic conversion of large land ownership into peasant land ownership. What was created is not social property, but a new form of private property, namely the breaking up of large estates into medium and small ones, or relatively large advanced units of production into primitive small units which operated with technical means from the time of the pharaohs. Nor is that all. Through these measures and their chaotic and purely arbitrary manner of execution, differentiation in landed property far from being eliminated was even further sharpened. Although the Bolsheviks called upon the peasantry to form peasant committees so that the seizure of the nobles' estate might in some fashion be made into a collective act, yet it is clear that this general advice could not change anything in the real practice and real relationships of power on the land. In other words, what Rose is saying is that the richer peasants got most of that land in the distribution. That you create private land holding, uh, that you buttress that kulak class, 
a contradiction, a profound contradiction. What happens when you want to collectivize the land, as Lenin says from the beginning, is the goal. Will you then not have to clobber the peasantry? Will you then not have to introduce that bureaucratic machine which becomes so oppressive within the Soviet structure? Risk number one. Risk number two, that European revolution. Now about that we'll talk at length, but with that European revolution there is a corollary, and is it ever considered? And the corollary is that the capitalist governments will be so threatened and so enraged that they will intervene against this new regime. That they will not only be able to curb the revolutionary currents in their own countries, but have resources left over to try to conquer this Soviet regime. Is that an unrealistic view? Not if you consider, for example, the policymakers in your own State Department in 1917. There is Robert Lansing looking at this thing and hearing Ambassador Francis from Petrograd saying that he is openly encouraging the Russians to overthrow this menace which has taken Russia out of the war and which threatens the whole order of private property. And so here is Lansing presenting a policy statement to President Wilson on the 7th of December of 1917, which President Wilson thought was a number one. And so Lansing writes, the Bolsheviks lack international virtue. That's such an American statement. The Bolsheviks lack international virtue. They are trying to make the ignorant and incapable mass of humanity dominant on the earth. We must then hope for and encourage a strong commanding personality to arise, to restore order and to maintain a government which can bring Russia into a sane post-revolutionary era. Risk number two, and then conception. What happened to those Soviets? If the conception is the proletarian state, if the conception is the economic state, if it is the idea that this great collective mass production machine of capitalism is to be put to the service of the mass of proletarians, that they are to become its employees, what then happens to the creativity, to the originality, to the association out of which a whole other creative revolution comes? Let's not unrest it. What the Russians did vis-a-vis fact, vis-a-vis matter, all of that was legalistic and very important. That divorce became possible almost at once on the consent of either partner. Uh, that marriage was a civil affair. Uh, that women had the right to choose freely. Uh, that there were collective creche or, or nurseries that were established in order to take care of children. All that's built in. But the family institution itself, not question. The institution, for example, of uh, marriage itself, which Bukharin and Kolantran subject to certain kinds of inspection in the early years of the 1920s. No, no. The point is that the entire disciplinary machinery of an older society gets built into the idea of this economic state. Because once you equate the quantity of production the necessity, after all, of establishing that infrastructure of quantity, that infrastructure of production, as the basis of this society, that so much that might creatively have begun to replace that conception of sheer quantity really must be subordinated. It's a problem of conception within which, after all, the state becomes important again, the Soviet disappears as a viable institution, the Cheka or the police, the bureaucracy, they've got to intervene in order to accomplish this transfer of this state machinery into the hands that will use it, presumably, for the good of the public. I yield to no one in my admiration for that work of Lenin, and nobody is more troubled by the ambiguities of that project 